Hello. We're going to be using Responsive Prayer 1, page 282 in the Lutheran Service Book. Holy God, holy and most gracious Father, have mercy and hear us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. Third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. Lord, keep this nation under your care, and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity, and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. For our cry, we're going to be using Psalm 148, 148, Psalm 148. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights above, praise him all his angels, praise him all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all ocean depths. Lightning and hail, snow and cloud, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted, his splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his saints of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Psalm 148 is, well, as you might have guessed, about praising God. But who's praising God in Psalm 148? Well, you actually see that this is divided uh, between heaven and earth. Those are the two main sections. So the heavens above, this would include the angels primarily, the, the, they're the ones who are mentioned first as parts of the creation. And then we start talking about sun and moon, uh, the shining stars. So uh, the angels and then the features within the heavens, the skies themselves, uh, beyond, beyond our atmosphere. And uh, basically it's a picture of heavens, the heavens above. And then we go down to the earth below, and in the earth below you go to the oceans, which God created in first. And then from the oceans you also get various aspects of the weather. So lightning, hail, snow, and clouds, these inanimate objects are also praising God. And in the midst of these things you also have sea creatures and land animals and uh, uh, flying animals. Well, then so it's basically uh, that which fills the creation, fills the earth. And last of all, you get uh, uh, human beings. First that are mentioned are those who are rulers, and then after those who are rulers, then you get uh, everybody else. 
uh, but you see kind of a uh, the unity of creation in praising God, and it's praising God because of his creation, praising him because he has made us and he is above all things. So we recognize as part of the creation we praise God. So, as we turn to our text for meditation today, Job chapter 39, verses 9 to 18, we're going to be looking at a couple aspects of the creation and how they're basically looking to God and how they relate to God and also how they relate to human beings. Um, uh, this is, since it is Job chapter 39, this is the second part of God's first speech in in the uh, last little bit of Job. And that means that this is featuring the animals. God is showing uh, a whole bunch of different animals to Job as examples, saying, this is how I care for these creatures. So uh, these creatures are related to God in the sense of being nourished and cared for by him. And if we're looking at it from a human perspective, well, we don't really have much of a part to play in anything in in Job chapter 39, because we're just observing all these things that God is doing within his creation. Now, with respect to Job, uh, this is to remind Job that God is taking care of everything in creation. So everything that has need, which receives what it does need, it is from God. So God is the one who's providing for all things. So Job even though he's in very dire straits at this particular point in time, because he has lost basically his entire life at this point, God is still holding and sustaining him. When we look to some of the animals, we can also see that uh, divided from human support, as Job himself is also divided from human support. Job, Job complains quite a few different times in his speeches how the people around him have rejected him, basically because, well, they assume that God is against him, therefore they say that Job is wicked or evil, or they don't even want to associate with him because uh, calamity might befall them as well. Uh, this is probably the case with Job's wife when she tells him to, to uh, curse God and die. That The motivation for that is that uh, she believes that as the head of the household, he bears responsibility for what has happened to the household, therefore he should die as a result. And going way, way back to Job chapter 2, where that actually takes place, I do argue that there are a couple different ways to actually read that. Maybe she's uh, uh, sympathetic to her husband and just wishing that he would be put out of his misery so that he doesn't necessarily have to suffer in this world any longer. And then there's the other main point of view, which is the dominant point of view, usually whenever you look into certain, uh, certain commentators throughout history, is that uh, she is acting as a secondary Satan, as it were, to try and get Job to fall into sin. Uh, basically, she takes issue with Job, says that everything's his fault, and she just wants him dead. So, anger and, and spite. But even though Job is removed from various supports, even, even the friends who turn on him during the dialogue, Job is still being cared for by God. He is not alone. He is still provided for. This is God's providential care that he is always taking care of us. So even if we say that everything in the world is against us, even if the world tries to claim our lives, if we find ourselves in the midst of war or conflict or even falsely accused and uh, sentenced in front of courts, such as many of the early martyrs in the Christian church, even some of the current martyrs in the Christian church, we are not outside of God's providence and we will still have all the blessings that God promises to us. So this is kind of how God is trying to frame all the animals for Job. But even though we have that context, it's a little bit odd for God to mention a couple of these things with respect to Job, because how can Job really relate? So I want to bring out the ox, the wild ox, and the ostrich. So those will be Job chapter 39, verses 9 to 12, and verses 13 to 18. And in both of these, it's... Um, well, well, let me just get into it and I'll explain it as we go. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will he stay by your manger at night? Can you hold him to the furrow with a harness? Will he till the valleys behind you? Will you rely on him for his great strength? 
Will you leave your heavy work to him? Can you trust him to bring in your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, and they cannot compare with the pinions and feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sun, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain. For God did not endow her with wisdom, or give her a share of good sense. Yet when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> Thanks be to God. <coughs> Excuse me. So the theme with the wild ox is that although wild ox, oxes are kind of a staple of labor within the ancient world, and Job himself has many oxen, like if he turned way back to the very, very beginning of the book, before all the calamities befell Job, where we see his vast wealth. So Job chapter 1, verse 3, it says, He had 500 yoke of oxen. And if he really wanted to, uh, we could also compare the verses right before the wild ox here. This would be Job chapter 39, verses 5 to 8, where it's talking about the wild donkey, which is completely independent of humanity. Well, Job has also said in chapter 1, verse 3, to also have 500 donkeys. But none of these are truly dependent on Job. They're truly dependent on God. So when, you, so when we talk about the ox here, where he's one of the main sources of labor that Job has, I mean, this is way, way back before you had things like tractors or, or just trucks in general or anything uh, mechanical that you could really put in to, to uh, uh, substitute well, muscle labor. The ox was the way that you would go. So, Job having the ox, God is asking him, will the ox actually consent to serve you? And specifically the wild ox, will the wild ox consent to work for you? And if you've ever tried to ta tame a wild animal, it can be very, very difficult. I haven't even tried to do it myself. But uh, seeing some of the difficulties people do have, it, it, it can be extremely difficult. So if you're bringing in a wild animal, how can you possibly tame it? And it's going to take a lot of time and attention uh, to try and make sure that this animal does what you want it to do. And uh, <clears throat> God kind of continues the question in verse 9 where he says, will, will the ox stay by your manger at night? So... After you've brought this animal in, would it voluntarily stay? Could you open the doors to a barn or something, and will it actually remain in the barn all night, or will it just kind of go back to where it came from? Well, odds are, if it's a wild animal, it'll go back to where it came from. This is also why you typically don't let uh, uh, your your pets have free reign over the backyard, why you don't necessarily have your doors open all the time, or why you would have your bird cage is just willy-nilly open and then also uh, uh, opening some windows. No, you know that these animals will try to return out to the wild and, well, as pet, pet owners, you might be concerned over their well-being, but God is talking about the wild ox whose natural place is the outdoors, so it will actually be taken care of. As God continues in the speech where he's saying, can you hold him to the furrow? Uh, will he till the valleys behind you? Will, he rely, will you rely on him for his great strength? Will you leave your heavy work to him? Will you trust him to bring your grain or gather it to your threshing floor? Uh, what God is trying to point out to Job is that the wild ox won't just follow the will of man as man wants. Uh, this bears some similarity to God's example of the donkey right before this, verses, seven, uh, sorry, verses 5 to 8. And if you look at my devotional on that one, I was trying to say, well, God is actually placing some value within uh, the creation that he, he's actually elevating this animal to say that I value this animal and I'm taking care of it independently of humanity. So you can also say the same thing with wild ox, that God is valuing this thing and saying that it doesn't necessarily belong to human beings. Human beings can use it, but if we're talking about... Uh, uh, 
ownership per se, well, the true owner is God. So human beings have been given dominion over the heavens, sorry, dominion over the earth, I should say. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, so way back at the beginning of creation, but that does not mean that we have absolute control over everything within the creation. That It's uh, something that we leave to God, and it's only through God that we even have control over the things that we have control over. And this is why it's so curious, because uh, in our modern society, we tend to think of, well, that which does work, that which does labor, in terms more of machines. We're talking, because uh, if I try to uh, give a talk on the Tenth Commandment, so this is, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife, his ox, or his donkey, uh, sorry, uh, his neighbor's wife, his manservant, or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Um, the ox and donkey can kind of throw people in the 21st century because we don't usually keep oxes or donkeys. So if I give an explanation of the 10th commandment, usually I'm going to try and relate these animals to 21st century ideas, or at the very least 20th century ideas of what these things could be which would normally be the equivalent of, say, tractors, other farming equipment in the case of the ox. For donkey, this would be uh, transportation. So you can also say your truck, because uh, donkeys as uh, animals of labor who are bringing various goods to various markets, well, you could just throw a whole bunch of stuff in the back of a truck or throw a whole bunch of stuff in the back of a car and zoom off and bring that there. And it's a, your car tends to be a little bit more cooperative than oxes or donkeys. You don't necessarily have to train um, a car, but you would have to do maintenance. I, I, so you, you have to take care of it, but it's still something that you can just use quite readily. You don't necessarily have to tame a wild donkey or wild ox in order to to uh, move around in the city. But if we're understanding the ox and donkey historically in that way, and, and this is kind of what God is pointing out here, is that this thing actually does have a mind of its own. Like you may be able to entrust a threshing machine to uh, get the, the, the grain off of some wheat, <clears throat> and this is kind of what God is saying in verse 12. Can you trust the wild ox to bring in your grain and gather it to their threshing floor? So can you trust a thresher to actually thresh your wheat? Yeah, you could probably do that. But I'm pretty sure any good farmer worth their salt would recognize, well, these things also need some maintenance. You can't just let this thresher go year after year without even trying to check it. You'd have to oil it or you try to... Uh, uh, replace parts or so, or even just try to inspect it to make sure that you don't have to replace parts. And it's really not as up to our will as we would like. So for the wild ox, for Job, Job was using these things all over the place. He had tons of them. But truly, these things belong to God. So for for trying to worship God as part of creation, recognize ourselves as part of creation, as Job is trying to recognize himself as part of creation. We should also recognize that we don't have full control. We have to rely on God for various things, and we actually have to treat the things that we find in creation as aspects of the creation. Uh, even with a threshing machine replacing animals, I mean, like, you can't really, God would say, like, does the ox thresh your, your grain? Yeah, no, 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 I don't think anybody actually had any, any threshing ox, that the ox was there just pulling uh, grain heads off of, off of the stalks, no. Um, even even when, when you have these things, they're still going to follow the way of the world and they're going to rest, they're going to break down, they're not going to be perfect every single time. And within our place 
uh, looking, you know, reflecting on our place within the world, we can say that, yes, things break down. We rely on God more than we know or more than we should, more than we actually do recognize. We should recognize that God is behind a lot of things that uh, we don't necessarily think a lot about. So if we're recognizing that the universe is constantly winding down, uh, constantly breaking down, and everything's aging, everything's falling apart, and what really, what really brings things back together is when uh, human beings create, that we're reflecting the image of God within us by creating within the world. God himself created all things. He created human beings to have dominion over the world. So we are the procreators. We're the ones who design things within the world. So even if we're looking at the things that we design, um, we recognize that, yes, we may have them together for a time, but these things will go the way of the world and break down. So if we want anything to be firmly established within the world, we have to look to God. So Job does not have control over over the world, Job has to rely on God himself. A little bit beyond that, I also wanted to mention the ox in relation to the ostrich, just because it, it is my default when talking about the Tenth Commandment, and just kind of explaining ancient, ancient economies, it's my habit to say that the ox is a the tractor or a whole bunch of other machines. Uh, even even the, uh, the donkey or the, or the ox could be used for a uh, for a millstone because once you have gathered in the grain, then you have to grind it down into flour, and you could try to do that manually, and it will take you quite some time. But since you're doing that with very heavy stones, the better way to do it is basically get the stones, millstones together, tie the top one to the donkey and then, or, or an ox, and the donkey or ox will go in a circle, turning the stone and grinding the grain down to flour. So uh, these things, uh, these animals, they act like machines, of course, for, for us, for all intents and purposes, even though we should be recognizing that these are aspects of God's creation and we should actually show them care and concern as God himself would show animals care and concern, even, even as he might show us care and concern, although uh, human beings, as we recognize, carrying the image of God, we are uh, uh, far more precious to God than, than plants or animals. Uh, Jesus himself says this, Matthew chapter 6. But this is part of our misconceptions when we actually look to, to ancient things, when we go like, well, we can try and get some parallel lines, but not everything is going to um, easily, easily explain itself. And this is what I want to get into with the ostrich. Because if you want to talk about the ostrich, uh, historically or even at the present, usually the comical depiction of the ostrich is that it's rather foolish. For the modern understanding of the ostrich being rather foolish, this is actually coming from a very ancient understanding, where it was thought that the ostrich buries its head underneath sand or plunges it within bushes in order to hide itself from predators. And if it, if it can't see anything with its head underneath, underneath some foliage or some sand, well then, uh, no predator can see it either. That's not actually a behavioral pattern of, of an ostrich, though. It's kind of this uh, a thing that we put in cartoons or other humorous ma comical materials, uh, similar to the the uh, <coughs> Looney Tunes exa uh, exemplar of an elephant being scared of a mouse. That this you have this wee little thing and it's scaring this big giant animal. Um, yeah, animals aren't, uh, sorry, elephants aren't really afraid of mice. They're just not. Uh, there's this tiny little thing and odds are the elephant will accidentally crush it by stepping on it or, or just laying down and crushing the, the mouse there. So it's just something that people put out that 
is not, not exactly true. Now, for the depiction of the ostrich here, it's also, uh, it's also uh, shown to be lacking in wisdom. And the, this is God himself speaking, that the, saying that for God did not endow the ostrich with wisdom or give her a share of good sense, this, this verse 17 here in Job chapter 39. But I'm not trying to say that God himself is um, this, or, or the scriptures here, it, that they're saying that this is a mistaken understanding of the ostrich, that the ostrich is actually fairly well designed. Well, if we're talking about God and his design, and this is what he's talking about, chapters 38 to 39, and we're also going to be getting into it with the behemoth and Leviathan in chapters 40 and 41. Well, God's design is good. It's just that he has not given every single creature every single gift. So the ostrich can actually be understood as lacking in some in some traits that would normally allow it to thrive. So the greatest example that that God gives here of the ostrich lacking uh, lacking wisdom is she lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild anime, animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain. So, it is harsh treatment of her young when they're in eggs and also after they're born. This is what God is saying is lacking in wisdom. And it's not that God has brought this animal into existence just to have it, well, lack in his wisdom, lack in his design. But what he's trying to say is that given the ostrich, how it's actually constructed, how it's actually designed, there are some potential dangers for it. So, normally a bird would lay its eggs in a nest in a tree or some other location that is easily protected from predators. Ostriches can't fly. <laughs> they have wings, but they cannot fly. Ostriches, they also, they also can't really put their eggs up in a location where predators can't easily get to them. Since ostriches are so uh, big and heavy, they can't necessarily ascend into into uh, uh, trees in order to put their eggs up there. <clears throat> so what they're going to do is they're going to put their eggs down below. And this means that uh, the eggs are rather vulnerable. Does it mean that the eggs are lacking in wisdom, that they're not really designed that well? Well, no, not really, because ostrich eggs, <clears throat> though really big and heavy, also have an extremely thick shell, which can... Uh, 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 withstand quite a bit of force. So, God actually designed these eggs to withstand some of the predatory activities around them, but uh, we still know that ostriches, <coughs> their nests are pretty vulnerable to predators and that they uh, might not uh, uh, be able to protect these. In fact, I was looking at a book, and I don't know if this is actually a correct figure, but it's saying that about 90% of ostrich nests are actually attacked by predators, and I don't know how you would really get to that statistic. And it seems incredibly high. But there is an extreme danger of this happening, and that's just by way of the ostrich's design. And the treating of the young harshly might actually be related to this, because if the ostrich actually is treating the young harshly, that could, add, that could mean that when they're still young and vulnerable, then unable to fly, unable to get away from big predators, that the harsh treatment may actually train the young so that they do not fall into uh, predators' grass as easily. So God is saying that she is without wisdom, that the ostrich is without wisdom in the sense that it's in these adverse conditions. But God is not saying that he ill-designed this creature. <laughs> this is also why he concludes in verse 18, Job chapter 39, by saying, 
Yet when the ostrich spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. So God is saying that he imbued the ostrich with great speed. And we still actually recognize this. Ostriches are very, very fast. And ostriches can outrun many predators. So if the ostrich has a rather big bird, and you can also have a, a, a nice heavy beak for, for protection there, well, the ostrich can escape rather quickly if it needs to. It can avoid being hunted down. It can also, uh, again, beak even talons on the foot. Uh, it can it can really uh, hurt some predators. I mean, it's, it's not a small animal. So it can actually defend itself if needs be. So it's not ill-designed in the sense that uh, God just cobbled a whole bunch of things together and went, oh yeah, that's fine, and tossed it off into creation. He's saying that it's, that the ostrich is without wisdom in the sense that it's lacking certain uh, features that other birds would have that would protect its young, but he is designing it still so that it can survive. So that is why it can move quite a lot. So uh, with our modern misunderstanding of ostrich, because we just say, oh, well, it's putting its head in its hand because it's so stupid. Well, that's completely false. But, we're, but we could actually say alongside God here, the ostrich is in a very bad position where it's very vulnerable in many ways, but it's actually still fairly well designed in that it can, it can uh, uh, escape predators. Um, I even saw a video way, way, way back in my life about ostriches, since, since they do have a very long neck, and this would make them vulnerable in the fight, that their, their windpipe is actually fairly adjustable in their neck. So if they get a blow to the neck, that will just move their esophagus to the side and then it goes right back. So it's not as though they're ill-designed in the sense that they're just going to go immediately into death. This is why we still have ostriches today. They weren't hunted to extinction <coughs> just because they had no means to defend themselves. We knew, though, that God has designed these creatures. And the overall message to Job with this, with Job's possible misunderstanding that these creatures are very ill-designed, that they're not suitable for life in this world, and that they're just going to die. Well, what God is trying to address here is that even though there are vulnerabilities within God's creatures, and it's not just limited to the ostriches, we, we could say that this is in most creatures that we do have some vulnerabilities. God is saying that he's still looking after them and he's still designing them so that they may live. So Job himself, even though he's extremely vulnerable at this point in time, that he's lost all of these means of subsistence, uh, his oxes, his donkeys, his camels, uh, his servants, his family, his children, uh, his social standing, he's lost all these things. It does not mean that God has left Job without any gifts, and the most precious gift that we actually have is God's salvation given to us. So, looking to, to Job's original situation, yes, God has blessed Job with many, many things, and Satan's original accusation to God was, oh, well, he's just following you because you have given him stuff. Well, God truly really knows the situation. Job is not worshiping God because God gave Job all these things. God gave Job these things because he loves Job. So all the blessings that we have are from God. And the most precious blessing that we have, which God never, ever took away, was the faith and salvation that he offers to Job. So... Job acting in faith, although he's saying many horrible things about God and to God, <laughs> um, he's still in faith in that he's still wanting to speak to God, wanting to defend himself, wanting to come further to his Lord so that the wrongs may be righted. So the blessing, the true blessings that we have of God, like even, even if everything else in this world was stripped away, even if we had nothing but our weaknesses left, is the salvation which God offers to us through faith. And this is uh, perfectly seen in Jesus Christ our Lord. And we can even use Jesus as an example. When Jesus came into this world to die upon the cross, well, he lost everything at the end there. He lost all sorts of security. 
he lost uh, <coughs> not necessarily his food and drink because, well, why would you really need that if you're being executed? <laughs> it, 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 that's not as pertinent to, to Job's economic status. But Jesus certainly lost his social standing. He lost the disciples right away when they were scattered at Gethsemane, uh, when Jesus was arrested. And Jesus was rejected by his own people. They were the ones who were trying to push Jesus through various show trials so that he would actually go to the cross and die. So Jesus was also without social standing, um, very, very vulnerable. And Jesus was also stripped at the cross, that the, the soldiers took off his clothes and they were dividing them amongst themselves. They were even casting lots for that to fulfill a uh, scriptural passage. Um, there's even some speculation that uh, Jesus was naked on the cross, because that would just be how people would uh, normally be crucified. But there's always a little bit of iffiness on if Jesus was actually naked, just because this was in uh, uh, Israel, so there might have been some sort of modesty covering, but whatever the case may be, even if there was some sort of modesty covering, like we do have in Say like all our artistic depictions on here, this uh, crucifix has Jesus with a modesty garment over his nether regions. <clears throat> but even, even with that, we would still say that Jesus is incredibly vulnerable, like he was still stricken, smitten, and afflicted. Uh, he was beaten quite heavily before going to the cross, and the cross itself, why would you get, uh, say, like furnished wood, nice smooth wood on the cross? Uh, it would be quite bad, actually, that uh, uh, Jesus, when he was trying to hold himself up with his feet, as when you're on the cross, um, your, your tendency is to go the, go down and with alongside your weight and just, over time, weaken with gravity. And uh, your, your arms would actually be pushing your chest inward on the top so that you would have trouble breathing. So in order to breathe, you would have to press down on the nail in your feet and uh, get enough elevation to breathe. And while you're going down and going back up, your back is scratching on unfurnished wood, which would also mean that Jesus probably had some splinters in his back, which was very recently beaten and most likely split open because of uh, the, the, the kinds of beatings that they would have at that time. So Jesus, all sorts of vulnerabilities right there into death, but... Jesus, despite saying some horrible things about God and to God, uh, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was still cared for by God. Uh, he, he is still, let's say, similar to, to the wild ox, even though uh, the creation rejected Jesus, that you have all sorts of sinners rejecting Jesus. This does not mean that God has fully forsaken Jesus in the sense that God is still with our Lord at the cross, and the Father is still going to bring Jesus up from death. This is exactly what St. Peter says, Acts chapter 2, just kind of recounting the events where he says that uh, the, the Father brought Jesus up from the dead because it was impossible for death to keep hold of him. So we do know that God will protect us, that he will look after us, even though we may be incredibly vulnerable within this world. And even though we may not have the things that we would like, such as the luxuries of food, drink, clothing, uh, warmth, <laughs> shelter, all of the basic necessities that we would like. Even if we're without these things, that does not mean that God has completely abandoned us. He will still be with us. He has not only designed our flesh, but designed our lives to be in him. He has brought us forth with a purpose, and that is to be forgiven in our Lord Jesus Christ that we may do the things that God has designed us to do way back in the Garden of Eden. We are to actually serve our Lord and serve one another. So if God is ensuring that we have all the blessings that we need, first and foremost, he is also ensuring that we have the ability to hear the, and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, who himself was as vulnerable as we are in this world, being in himself in the likeness of a human being, himself being and living as a servant for all of us. <clears throat> we 
We know that God will bless us through this and he will give us what we truly need. Amen. Let us conclude with the noon prayer, page 284. Gracious Jesus, our Lord and our God, at this hour you bore our sins in your own body on the tree, so that we, being dead to sin, might live unto righteousness. Have mercy upon us now and at the hour of our death, and grant to us, your servants, with all others who devoutly remember your blessed passion, a holy and peaceful life in this world, and through your grace, eternal glory in the life to come, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord God Almighty, we know that you have brought all things forth in creation, the oxes, the donkeys, the ostriches, and we thank you, Lord, for all these precious gifts to us. Thank you for designing them, bringing them in as living creatures. And we ask you for discernment when we govern them as those you have given dominion to uh, for the whole of creation. I see for your guidance as we live alongside these creatures. And we ask you, O oh Lord, to always provide for us. Provide for us and all living creatures with well, the natural bounty of creation. But please, O oh Lord, also uh, give to us the most precious gift of Jesus Christ and ensure that he never leave us or forsake us, his, his forgiveness, his salvation in this life, that despite whatever losses we may experience within the creation, that we may also always hold on to Christ and be found in the new creation, the world without sin, without pain, without death or mourning or crying out anymore. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.